that's it. So good afternoon or morning or evening or good time, whatever the time zone you're currently based in. And thank you so much for joining us in another one in our series of Living Longer Better. The Living Longer Better series is a monthly online seminar series on healthy aging. My name is Dr. Rob Sagaro Gomez, and I am together with my colleague, Hannah Austin, the organizers of, of, of this series that has been running now for about a year, actually. Before I have the honor of introducing today's speaker, I'd like to remind folks of the existence of a relatively brand new research network called ARCH. ARCH is uh, the Aging Research Collaborative Hub, which is an online platform that highlights some of the excellent research on investigations related to precisely the topic of living longer, but also better. It features some of the research across the University of Oxford and its four main divisions, as well as industrial partners and collaborators across the UK and overseas. And if you're not aware of this platform, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at it. Now, some general rules of engagement. Um, I'd like to ask that during the, the, the talk by our speaker today, you please mute yourself and um, you may or may not want to consider leaving your camera on so that our speaker feels like she has got that audience indeed that she's speaking and sharing her research with. After my very brief introduction of the speaker, she will have about 30 minutes or so to present to us her research followed by a Q&A. I also encourage the audience to log in their questions in the chat channel, which should be found at the top with a chat icon. After the seminar has been given, we will then move on to the Q&A, which I will, be, uh, I will be mediating so that you can ask your question to the speaker. Obviously, as a reminder, this seminar has been recorded in the effort to make in this presentation available to uh, different time zones. And this will be made available through the Twitter handle of the Department of Zoology at Oxford. And now as per the speaker, I'm obviously every time very excited to be able to introduce different speakers from different topics and different universities. Today, we're gonna keep it in house. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Arti Jagannath. Arti, I apologize if I've not pronounced your name correctly, please correct me. Arti is, as you will see, quite an exceptional researcher. She's currently an associate professor at the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences, where she was previously also a research fellow. She's currently also a BBSRC David Phillips fellow at the Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience Institute, SCNI, here at Oxford. She has also held research fellowships from, for instance, the L'Oreal UNESCO, Framework for Women in Science. Before that, she was a Roche postdoc fellow at the Nafil Lab of Ophthalmology, I can't pronounce this word, so I apologize, Ophthalmology here at Oxford. And before that, she did her both DPhil at Bracenose and Masters in Integrative Biosciences here at Oxford. Prior to that, she was based in India, where she did her bachelor's in biotechnology at the Anna University. Among a really impressive research outputs, um, she's been highly esteemed to be part of the junior faculty member for F1000, which is an accolade that not many researchers achieve, particularly given her extraordinarily junior status. Arzi, we're really excited to have you here today. We thank you for your time and we look forward to hearing from you regarding your talk on how the circadian clock senses time. I will now unshare my screen and ask you to please share yours. Thank you very much again. Thanks very much, Ro. That's a very kind introduction. And it's really nice to speak um, at zoology again. I was at zoology many, many moons ago now and have fond memories of the place. I only wish this could have been in person so I could come back and engage in the building again. But um, let me try and share this presentation. And I apologize for my voice. It's a constant battle with hay fever this time of the year. Uh, so I'm going to share a couple of stories right now from the research um, I've been doing on how circadian rhythms are set to the right time frame. <laughs> 
so to start with, to tell you why we're interested in this, uh, so circadian rhythms have been a feature of almost all life on Earth ever since life evolved. And this is for a very good reason. It's because the Earth has experienced this 24 hour rhythm in day and night, as long as we know that life has existed here. And so the day is a very different place from the night um, and animals that can, and plants for that matter, that can anticipate these daily changes in temperature, uh, daylight rhythms, activity of other organisms such as prey are the ones that have a selective advantage and therefore fare the best. And uh, <clears throat> again, as I said, this is a feature of nearly all life over here on Earth. For humans, this is core to our biology. So almost everything that we do is rhythmic in uh, our bodies. It's not just simply the sleep-wake cycle, but nearly every aspect of our physiology is controlled by the circadian rhythm. So to give you um, as a, some idea over here as to how this clock is actually set to the right time. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, so nearly every aspect of our physiology is rhythmic and you can see over here a few different rhythms that we've illustrated. So core body temperature, blood pressure dips at night and rises during the day. Alertness also does this. You, I mean, our, our uh, dip in alertness is about two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And at this time, our alertness is low enough to be uh, classified as below suboptimal performance, at which point you're not allowed to be legally driving almost drunk. So that's how much of an effect the clock has on our bodies. Um, and which is why, of course, disruption of circadian rhythms, as we experience right now in our daily lives, where we're no longer following this 24 hour day night rhythm by artificially modifying our environments as much as we like, is having knock on consequences on all these aspects of our behavior and physiology. Uh, so what we're interested in is how this clock is set to the right time and what would happen if it's not. And uh, just again, to give you some context over here, there's, any, there's only any reason to be having a clock if that clock is reporting the correct time. If it's reporting the wrong time, you're going to be badly placed in order to be able to perform at your optimal best. And for the circadian clock, the primary uh, cues for what the time is in the outside world come from light. And so light information is picked up through the eyes and then transmitted uh, directly into a, a nucleus within the hypothalamus, which is just here where this red line has been shown, where you find these paired nuclei known as the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And within the suprachiasmatic nuclei, each cell maintains a rhythm in its firing, in its uh, metabolic activity. And this rhythm is collectively seen across all cells in the SCN. And this, this rhythm is set to be in sync with the outside world through this light information that is being passed on from the eye. And this clock in the SCN is the master body clock. And what this master clock then does is that it transmits its information through neuronal and hormonal signals through the rest of the body. So, and and as a result, there are peripheral clocks throughout the body, and these peripheral clocks act on these signals to then coordinate their own circadian rhythms, which then maintain rhythmic physiology in all these downstream cells. At its core, the clock is a molecular machine. It's, it's a transcription, transcription feedback loop. And there are these two transcription factors, clock and BMA, that they drive the expression of hundreds of thousands of proteins, but also their own repressors. The repressors shown here are period and cryptochrome. And what period and cryptochrome tend to do is by inhibiting clock and BVAL, they're of course inhibiting their own production. And what then happens as a result is that uh, clock and BVAL will then be free to then bind to the DNA and start this cycle all over again. This cycle takes about 24 hours, which is how a 24 hour rhythm is maintained. And importantly, this regulation by clock and BMA happens to happen across thousands of genes over here because the binding element for clock and BMA, which is known as an E-box, is in front of many, many different genes, which then go on to establish the sorts of rhythmic behavior and physiology we've been discussing, such as rhythms and growth hormone secretion, blood pressure regulation, et cetera. Uh, so what we've been working on for quite some time now is trying to understand exactly what light does. So what sorts of uh, information uh, is being picked up by the eye? Uh, 
And then what does the eye do with that information? And what then happens when that information is transduced into the brain? So what in the brain downstream of light, what sorts of receptor signaling pathways are engaged? Um, what sort of transcriptional systems are activated? And how do these eventually converge on clock genes to set that 24 hour rhythm? And one of the outcomes of doing this research is that we then understand how the environment can naturally move the hands of the clock and what these pathways are. And by understanding what these pathways are, we then get a route in to be able to move the hands of the clock ourselves when it's not working as it should. Uh, so this is research where we started looking at this sort of thing. So this was many years ago right now, where what we did was to look at the, the transcriptome within this master clock in the brain in the SCM that is regulated by light and to find what sorts of signals were being turned on and off in response to this sort of light. And the light that I'm talking about here is not the normal daylight cycle, but the light that would cause disruption of our circadian rhythm, such as nocturnal light. And what we found was that um, a few genes were upregulated, many downregulated. But among these genes that were upregulated, one particular one that could explain the sensitivity of the clock to light, we found was this kinase called SIC1. Salt inducible kinase 1 uh, is a, a kinase that can regulate the activity of CREB. And to cut a long story short, because this, this was published a few years ago now, what we found was that. Um, downstream of light that activates uh, signaling cascades downstream of um, receptors within the SCN, you trigger cyclic AMP-based uh, signaling, which switches on this transcription factor CREB. And CREB, along with its cofactor CRTC, drives the expression of the clock gene per one. And this clock gene per one can then go on and set the phase of the clock and therefore move the hands of the clock to the right spot. What also happens is that this other gene, SIC1, is also switched on. And SIC1, as a kinase, can phosphorylate CRTC. And by phosphorylating CRTC, it switches it off. And therefore, it turns off CREB transcription and limits how much transcription can happen downstream of light. And therefore, SIC1 can act as a break on how much the clock can shift in response to light. Why is any of this important and how do we relate to this? I suppose one situation in which we understand what all this means is by looking at jet lag. So jet lag is where when any organism, whether it's a fly or a human or a plant is moved to a new time zone, it takes time to adjust its clock to this new light dark cycle that it's experiencing. And the typical rate at which this happens for nearly all life is about an hour a day. So what SIC1 is doing is limiting this, this shift of the clock to one hour a day. What we should be able to see when you remove SIC1 from the equation is that the same amount of light can go a lot further and therefore cause the clock to shift much faster ahead in time. And therefore, typically what would happen is a mouse is normally nocturnal. And what is shown over here on the left is a control animal. And in the black bar, which is night, the mouse tends to run on its wheel, which is shown here by these gray bars. At this point, what we do is turn off the lights. And what you should see in a control animal is that it moves an hour a day until it catches up with this new light dark cycle here, which is about six hours ahead or similar, similar to say flying to Thailand. What should happen in the absence of sick is within a day or two, this mouse should have been able to catch up to the new light dark cycle. So here are the data, and this is what we saw. You can see here a control animal that has moved slowly an hour a day over here to catch up to this new time zone, whereas the SIC1 knockout has moved pretty much immediately. So silencing SIC1 allows the clock to move a lot faster, resulting in rapid reentrainment of the clock. As I said, this was a few years ago now. So what we've done since then is to look at an animal in which um, SIC1 is not active. So if you remove SIC1 completely, that tends to have a few knock-on effects. But what we did is to look at a mouse in which this kinase SIC1 is um, modified such that it, the mouse is overexpressing a version of the kinase that cannot work. So in this situation, what we see is exactly the same phenotype, which is that a control animal at progressively dim light dark cycles moves its activity and drifts along until it catches up with these cycles. Whereas with a SIC1 knock-in animal, you can see these rapid shifts in activity and very stable activity over there. So the phenotype that we observed, which is that this animal essentially is not jet lag, is there in this other model that we've been looking at. And then what we decided to do with this mouse is to take it further and say, 
how is this mouse's physiology affected by the loss of sick one? And of course, we could look at many different factors such as met metabolism, we could look at um, immune function and uh, so on. What we decided to do, first of all, is to say sick one is a kinase, and this is a kinase that we know acts on the clock, but clearly it acts on other things as well. So what we did is to look at the phosphoproteome. So we looked at the phosphoproteome of the whole brain uh, by uh, harvesting the whole brain, enriching for phosphopeptides, and then doing a mass spec. So the work that I'm showing you here was done by a postdoc in the lab, Lewis Taylor. And what he found was that in a wild type animal, if you subject it to this sort of jet lag like experiment where it's given uh, a light dark cycle that it has to adapt to, what happens is that the phosphoproteome of the brain changes in a way that um, you can see over here. So in the, on the left over here are uh, proteins that are enriched in the control conditions and therefore seen lower in, when, when a mouse is experiencing jet lag. And on the right are those phosphoproteins that are higher when a mouse is experiencing jet lag. What you see typically when you look at the types of genes that these are is that they tend to be enriched in synaptic components. So they tend to be um, synaptic scaffolding proteins, receptor proteins, uh, vesicle uh, trafficking proteins, etc. Interestingly, what happens in the sick one knockout animal, however, is that uh, you don't see a lot of these proteins being phosphorylated. So these changes in the phosphoproteome that were happening, that were shaping the synapse are not happening in the sick one knock-in animal. Uh, again, to show you what sorts of proteins these are over here, they're involved in, of course, glutamate signaling, in uh, scaffolding at the synapse, but importantly, where we've also seen them show up very recently is in groups that were studying sleep. Why sleep? Because there's this very exciting theory that is coming out right now, which suggests that the phosphoproteome is one of the few molecular correlates we have of sleep. So what sleep is at a molecular level tends to still be a huge mystery. I mean, we know a lot about the clock. We know a lot about circadian rhythms at the molecular level. In comparison, we know very little about sleep other than the fact that EEG signals are disrupted. But what happens within these cells when we're sleeping and what um, the molecular correlates of something that can cause sleep are, are, are still quite a mystery. And what was a big breakthrough a few years, I mean, maybe two years ago now, was this understanding that phosphorylation at the synapse is a marker of sleep pressure. So the sleepier you are, the more highly phosphorylated these proteins at the synapse are. But if you look at what sorts of proteins these, these studies showed, they were again the same things that we found, RIMS, piccolo, bassoon, uh, the glutamate receptors, which again, all of these things were also seen in our model where we were experiencing circadian disruption or night at light. And these were absent in the sick one mouse. So what we asked next is, so what does this mean? Does this mean our sick one knock-in mouse cannot sleep properly? Sorry, let me just shut that door because I think the, it's starting to rain and then they probably not hear me. Yeah, so the question we asked then was, is this telling us that there's something wrong with how this mouse that does not experience jet lag sleeps? Does it mean we've gone and messed up its sleep by making its clock this plastic? Under baseline conditions, we looked at several different readouts, but it's non-REM sleep, it's REM sleep, total amounts of sleep, the bins and fragments of sleep, they all tended to be just fine. So there was nothing wrong with how this mouse was sleeping. But what we did find is that when you disrupted the circadian rhythm, so when you gave this mouse jet lag in the way that we did previously, a wild type animal would move its light dark cycle slowly. But importantly, when it's moving its activity to catch up to this new light dark cycle, it alters its sleep patterns massively. So sleep is induced in a wild type animal when it's experiencing jet lag. However, in the sick one knockout animal, you can see over here in red, that's not happening at all. So the sick one knockout animal is not sleeping when you disrupt the light dark cycle in the way that a wild type animal would. So what this was telling us is that sick one is regulating sleep in addition to regulating the circadian clock, but the way it's doing it 
is in response to light. So it's doing it by saying it follows the light dark cycle and uses the light dark cycle to provide that information both to the clock, but to also to sleep to then tell the animal at what time to go to sleep and when. Um, so what we're doing by working on sick further is uh, showing that at the synapse, there are all of these proteins that are differentially phosphorylated, either in response to the clock or in response to sleep. And by response to the clock, I mean by following the light dark cycle. And SIC1 is the kinase that transduces that message from light through to these proteins to then regulate the sleep cycle in addition to regulating the clock. So what we're working on at the moment is to try and understand the role of this whole SIC family. So the, the, the paper that originally showed that the, the phosphoproteum at the synapse is tracking sleep happened to also show that the kinase that was mediating those changes was SIC3, which is a kinase that belongs to the same family as SIC1. So while SIC3 is tracking sleep pressure, SIC1 is tracking the environment. And so therefore, by tracking your own physiological need for sleep, but also by tracking the environmental conditions about whether or not it's the right time to sleep, you then achieve the optimal sleep-wake timing. And what we're trying to understand is exactly how the sick family controls all of this by being at the hub. Um, so that's our work with this salt inducible kinase family. I'm just going to briefly, briefly tell you about another story. Uh, this one we just published uh, a couple of months ago now in Nature Communications. And um, what we were working on here is was, was a more translational aspect where we said, well, we have a lot of information on how light regulates the circadian clock and how light controls timing of the circadian clock. Are we able to now translate this information to developing a compound that would act on the same sorts of signaling pathways, same sorts of GPCRs that we could then drug with the compound and then therefore also affect the clock. So are we able to are we able to make some sort of compound or some or target some sort of signaling pathway that would then achieve whatever light is achieving, which is to move the hands of the clock? So to do this, we collaborated with the Department of Pharmacology, uh, at where uh, which she was favored over there using this cell culture model of the clock, where I'm just going to try and see if this video will play or it won't right now. I'm sorry about that. But what you will have seen had it played was that in this cell line, what we've got is that the clock gene promoter per two drives the expression of luciferase. And therefore what you see is that the cells glow on and off with this 24 hour rhythm. And by tracking the glow, you can then track what the strength of the clock is, how long it is, how quickly it moves, et cetera, but all in a cellular model rather than have to go straight into the brain. So this is, a sort, this is the sort of readout that you would see. So this is a recording over five days. And in the box that's highlighted, you can see five of these peaks and troughs over there. And what we're looking for uh, when we did a drug screen was for compounds that could make the, the rhythm stronger or weaker or longer or shift the phase of the clock and therefore move it out of sync, for example. What we found uh, is that adenosine receptor antagonists were very strong uh, potent modulators of the circadian rhythm in cells. So adenosine, of course, is something that you might be familiar with in the context of caffeine. So caffeine is an adenosine receptor antagonist. And interestingly, around the same time, we saw some papers coming out suggesting caffeine could affect the clock. And so this was something that was in the press a lot because, of course, caffeine is something that almost all adults take in their daily lives to regulate their own uh, activity sleep levels but of course this what this was suggesting is that also it was going to have a direct effect on their circadian rhythms and what we found <coughs> is that this was entirely true it wasn't just caffeine lots of other adenosine receptor antagonists were also able to have this effect on the clock what they did was to make the period of the circadian rhythm longer in cells so what you see over here are cells in which this compound cgs15943 which is an adenosine receptor antagonist is lengthening the rhythm of that pertulac oscillation and then at this point by washing out the drug you revert the rhythm to normal and uh, showing that this compound was having a transient effect on the clock that we could clearly measure what we thought was we discovered something that was mimicking light the effects of light on the rhythm 
However, what we found is that adenosine receptor antagonists were, adenosine receptor agonists, sorry, were acting via the pathway we thought, which is the induction of cyclic AMP and CREM, which is the pathway I spoke to you earlier when we were talking about light. However, adenosine receptor antagonists, and we tried several of them in these blue-green colors, were not able to do that. They were not able to switch on the same signaling pathway. However, these adenosine receptor antagonists were definitely switching on the expression of clock genes, but just at a much more delayed time scale. So you can see here in blue, about eight to 10 hours after administration of the clock gene, you get a peak, I mean, administration of the adenosine antagonist, you get a peak in the expression. However, if you used an agonist, this would have happened much, much quicker. So we were still activating some sort of transcriptional pathway that was leading to the clock, but it wasn't the classical pathway that was uh, used by light. So what we did then next is to look for what this pathway was. What is this other pathway by which adenosine receptors are engaging with the clock? And uh, for this, we decided to go straight to look for the signaling element. So the binding site in the DNA that was activating the expression of this clock gene per two by doing a transcription factor screen called STARPROM. And for this, we collaborated with Uli Schimbler, who is a circadian researcher in Geneva. And what this experiment involved is a library of synthetic transcription factors, each of which is barcoded. And then by looking at which of these barcodes is lighting up in an RNA-seq experiment, you then can then work backwards and from there and work out what this binding element was in the DNA. And what we found was, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Yeah. What we found is that adenosine receptor antagonists were activating this particular site over there, which is TGACTCA. And what's interesting about this site is that it's a very common transcription factor binding site. It's the AP1 binding site, and AP1 is uh, faucet June. Faucet June must be familiar to most biologists in some function or the other. But in the context of circadian rhythms, we know that faucet June are two of the main factors that are activated downstream of light. And this is exactly what we see in the SCN as well. So one of the main factors that is triggered in the SCN transcriptome after exposure of light is the same one, which is a TGACTCA. And this, this site is there in the PER2, in, the main, in one of the main clock gene promoters over here, as you can see, and it's conserved. What we then did is to work backwards and say, let's fill this pathway out. We found the binding element. We confirm that the, the, the transcription factor that binds to this binding element is AP1 because silencing of AP1 reduced the expression of uh, the clone to drug. What we also found is that, uh, oh, yeah, what we also found is that the kinase that was upstream of the activation of AP1 was another kinase that is very well established to work with phosphogen, which is ERK. And the signaling messenger that was releasing, that was activating this ERK was uh, calcium. In that you can see here in orange, an adenosine receptor antagonist releases calcium from the cells, whereas uh, an agonist does not. So then by having worked out this signaling pathway, we then moved in vivo. And then what we said is, in a mouse, would this compound still work in the way we thought it would and shift circadian rhythms? So for that, the, ex the expression of the adenosine receptors has to be there in the SCN in the first place. And it was, you can see here, the adenosine receptor in two different sub subtypes, A1 and A2A, are both expressed within the uh, SCN of a mouse. And isolating an SCN, you can have the same sort of readout as I showed you with cells, which is where you monitor the expression of PER2 with uh, luciferase. And what you see here is that it, you have a control slice here in black, which maintains about a 24 hour rhythm or a daily rhythm as shown over here. And uh, two different adenosine receptor antagonists here in blue and green, both lengthen the period, showing that outside of a mouse, the master clock is sensitive to adenosine signaling. We also showed that within a mouse, if you give an IP injection of an adenosine receptor antagonist, what you see is that uh, the main clock genes that are responsible for setting the phase of the clock, which are per one and per two, are increased in their expression. So based on all of this, we decided to do some behavioral experiments to measure what happened in the clock. So from all of every, everything that we understood from our work in cells and what we know about light, we said adenosine antagonists should be able to phase shift circadian rhythms 
And by phase shifting circadian rhythms, I mean change the relationship between the activity and the onset of lights. So make an animal more night-like or more day-like, for example. The second thing it should do is a denizene receptor antagonist should be able to strengthen the effect of light on the clock. So uh, not only should it be able to shift the clock on its own, it should be able to work on those same pathways as light and therefore increase the effect of light on the clock. So here are the data. So here we've got this uh, adenosine receptor antagonist, this compound from J&J, &J, which uh, we've shown over here when administered to an animal in the middle of a day, it causes the activity of the animal to jump forward. So the animal has gone forward in time by an hour or two, and therefore it's phase advanced. However, the same compound administered in the middle of the night, so in the middle of its active phase, has the opposite effect, it delays the clock. And this is something that we know occurs commonly in, in response to light as well. So light at certain times will advance the clock, whereas at other times it will delay the clock. And the reason for this, of course, is that if light has the same effect on your clock all the time, then it is not a relevant signal anymore because light has to be able to shift your clock in both directions so that your clock matches the correct time zone outside. And this is exactly what this compound is doing as well. Regarding the second prediction, which is that it should be able to enhance the effects of light on the clock. Again, we did this jet lag sort of experiment where this animal was originally living in the UK time zone over here on top. Whereas uh, on this day, along with the administration of the compound, we shifted the light dark cycle six hours and therefore flew the mouse east. And what you see here is that, again, the control animal moves slowly to the new time zone, whereas an animal that's been given the adenosine receptor antagonist, along with the shift of the clock at the same time, has moved much faster. And this has just happens in a dose responsive way over here. Right, so essentially what this is showing is that we have a compound that works on circadian rhythms that you can use in mice. But of course, the fundamental question in biology was why? Why does the clock care? Why is the clock tracking adenosine levels? So what we hypothesized is that adenosine is, uh, well, we didn't hypothesize this. We know very well that adenosine is a signal that is tracking your sleep need in the brain. So the sleepier you are, the higher the levels of adenosine in the brain. And that adenosine signaling through its receptors then inhibits the activity of many of these nuclei within the brain, which then promotes the sleepiness drive which is why caffeine works to keep you alert because caffeine by antagonizing those receptors does not allow adenosine to have this action on sleepiness. What we hypothesized was that this elevation in adenosine that happens because you're sleepy would act on the adenosine receptors in the SCN and depress the expression of clock genes. And therefore that sleep pressure itself, your sleep behavior itself, feeds back to your circadian rhythm to either strengthen it or weaken it. And therefore the prediction is that if you're sleep deprived, then you will have a, a weaker as well as a more delayed circadian rhythm. So to look for this, what we did first is to say, does adenosine itself change in, in, in the brain? Uh, in, within the SCN, you can see here two different nuclei. Here we've looked at the basal forebrain and ZT0. ZT0 is uh, when the lights go on and therefore when a mouse is uh, least sleepy, I mean most sleepy. And what you see over here is that in the basal forebrain, there is a high level of adenosine. Please note that the scale is logarithmic over here. There's a high level of adenosine in the brain, whereas when a mouse is just woken up, there's a low level of adenosine in the basal forebrain. We saw the same sort of trend within the SCN as well. But importantly, what we also found is that light would normally cause the shift of a circadian rhythm. So light would a light at night would normally cause your circadian rhythm to shift by about an hour, which is shown over here. But if you sleep deprive an animal, the effect that that light can have on the clock is no longer as strong. And therefore sleep deprivation it reduces the size of that shift to light, as shown over here in blue. And then what we did is to say, is this effect of sleep deprivation linked to adenosine? And if it is, if we antagonize the adenosine receptors, we should then be able to block that effect of sleep deprivation. And that's, that is what you see over here again, by administering an adenosine receptor antagonist, what you see over here is that sleep deprivation now 
does no longer have an effect on how effective light is at shifting the circadian rhythm. So light is still able to maintain a one to two hour shift of the circadian rhythm, even if the animal is sleep deprived. Then finally, what we also did is to look at a mouse in which uh, constitutively the levels of adenosine in its brain are maintained as low, no matter how sleepy it is, because it overexpresses uh, adenosine kinase. And adenosine kinase will phosphorylate any free adenosine to adenosine monophosphate, and therefore the levels of adenosine that can signal through its receptors are maintained at a very low level. In this animal, because it has low levels of adenosine, what we would predict is that the effects of light should be stronger and also the clock itself should be longer. And that's exactly what we saw, which is that a nighttime light pulse gives you a greater shift in the circadian clock in these mice. Also, uh, the length of the circadian period has increased in these animals. Showing that, so what this shows essentially is that adenosine under natural conditions is signaling to the circadian clock. And the reason it's doing this is to be able to communicate some information about your sleep state. Uh, and so essentially what we were suggesting there is that adenosine is giving you information on sleep state to be able to modulate the normal right responses of your circadian clock. And where the context for this comes in is here, for example, whether you're nocturnal or diurnal, you always have the same response to light, which is that light during the day is ineffective, but light at night will shift your clock. Light at dusk will delay your clock and light at dawn will advance your clock, whether you're nocturnal or diurnal. The difference, however, is that nocturnal animals are much more sensitive to dusk light than dawn light, Whereas diurnal animals are much more sensitive to dawn light than dusk light. So humans and mice essentially have a similar response to light as far as their circadian clock is concerned. However, the strength of light and what it can do to your clock is very different if you're a mouse or a human. And what we, and this for a long time has not been explained. Whereas what we think is that the explanation behind this, at least partly, is probably due to adenosine. Because what would happen in a nocturnal animal is that it's been asleep throughout the day. Therefore, its levels of adenosine at dusk are low. And therefore, the size of the phase shift that light can give you at dusk is high. Whereas it's awake, whereas a diurnal animal has been awake throughout the day. So what happens then is that the levels of adenosine at dusk are very high. Therefore, the same amount of light cannot have a big effect on the clock. And so this allows your, each animal to be able to mount an appropriate response to light disruption based on what the, animal temporal, the animal's temporal leash is. So we decided to test this. And what we did to test it is to use pharmacology again and to say that uh, drugs that activated the excitatory arm of adenosine signaling shown here in orange would increase the effects of light on the clock whereas drugs that depressed the same axis were shown here in pink would reduce the effect of light on the clock. So these, this, is the, this is what we predicted would happen. And I'm just gonna show you some data now. You can see over here that at dusk, the orange bars are always bigger than the blue, which is the control, whereas the pink bars are smaller, showing that adenosine modulation will directly influence how much of an effect light can have on the clock. So to summarize this, what we found is that uh, adenosine signaling as well as light signaling share many parallels. So they share a lot of common elements downstream of their receptors. So while adenosine signals through adenosine receptors, light will signal through glutamate and PCAP receptors on the SCN. Downstream of these receptors, however, both light and adenosine will activate similar uh, signaling pathways, which are calcium ERK AP1 or CREB, uh, cyclic AMP, CREB, AP1, and ultimately give rise to very similar effects on the clock. And depending on which arm you engage and to what extent, you can shift, you can modulate how sensitive you can, it's like a tuning dial, you can increase or decrease uh, the volume of what we're seeing happens. So an animal will sum up all these different sources of information. It will, so it will sum up its own sleepiness drive, it, its own experience of whether or not it had to stay awake at that time, perhaps, 
uh, as a, to look for food or perhaps to adapt to a certain niche that it needed. Also, it will take into account the environmental signals with light and sum up all of that information together through these pathways that I've just described to give you the right sorts of sleep-wake timing for the niche that you need to occupy. So in terms of biology, that, that, that is what we think is uh, this study is explaining, which we think is very exciting. Also in terms of therapeutics, of course, this is also a target that can be developed in the clinic for uh, correcting circadian rhythms where they're disrupted. And therefore, uh, in order to be able to do that, to do the clinical trials, we've established a spin out company called Circadian Therapeutics, which is currently trialing uh, this compound. And uh, where we think this would be of use is not simply in people who are experiencing jet lag, but in almost every psychiatric condition, uh, for example, or across, uh, you see a, a lot of circadian sleep disruption across many, many different domains of health, psychiatry, uh, metabolic disease, cancer, and in all these different conditions, having an agent that can stabilize the clock is probably going to be of great therapeutic value. And uh, that's where we're hoping to see this go in the future. So with that, I'll thank uh, all of my collaborators. So these are the members of my lab who were involved in this study. Uh, Lewis, who was working on SIG1, I showed you before. Uh, Norbert, Simona, <coughs> Uh, the ones who are working on uh, the adenosine uh, pathway, my collaborators outside, Sri Vasudevan and Russell Foster, who have been involved in all these studies so far, and uh, several others from across several other universities. But I will stop with that for now and take any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Arzi, for an excellent presentation. I can see a lot of virtual claps in the audience as well. Fantastic. Oh, so we're now going that. to. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a button at the bottom that you can you can choose for for different items such as uh, clapping your hands virtually. As it turns out, <laughs> one of the features of Microsoft Teams, I suppose, in Zoom. Um, so fantastic. So we're going to move over to the final part of this seminar, which is the Q and A. I encourage folks to either write down their questions in the chat channel or to simply unmute themselves and also to uh, freely turn on their cameras if they would like to. Perhaps one of the questions that we could get started with, uh, which I'm sure you've been thinking about quite a bit, Arti, is on the topic of living longer better, right? The, the, the concept of circadian rhythm and circadian clock comes in really importantly, as it probably shifts throughout the lifespan of a human individual. Yeah. Um, why, why does it change? Uh, please, please educate me on that topic. Why does it change in the ways that it changes? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. And uh, there are lots of reasons actually why it changes. So the clock is not response. So the clock is the, the clock's strongest time cue is probably light and light sensitivity does decrease over time. And so the levels of light input that are getting to the clock reduce but also the clock itself tends to become less responsive to light as the older you get. So that, that is one of the reasons this happens. But of course, there are lots of other reasons as well. So there's more desynchrony that happens across the cells as uh, you get older. Uh, the other influences like hormonal changes happen quite a lot. So people tend to become earlier and earlier the later in life they get. Why that happens, we don't really know, but we think it's probably something to do with hormonal rhythms where your hormonal rhythms are peaking when you're an adolescent. And when they're peaking, you tend to be a very late type, which is why teenagers cannot get out of bed early. <laughs> but on the other hand, they become earlier and earlier and earlier throughout life. Still, when you're older, your rhythms are weaker, but also you're much earlier. In so, so there are many different reasons why this happens. And what we're finding all out also is that it's not simply a network phenomenon at that level. And as I've shown, we're also working on things like uh, how the clock controls gene transcription, genomic stability. The clock is a core element of all this as well. It's, it's one of the core determinants of how these things would happen at the same time. And when the clock is weaker, all of these things tend to fall apart as well. And so it's, it's sort of, they're all feeding into one another. And together, I think the effects that we're seeing across aging, it's probably one arm exacerbating the other throughout over yeah. there. And so, yeah, that, I think it's, it's, it's a really important part of aging. And when it comes to when it comes to older ages, is it just that individuals 
humans, uh, we, we tend to wake up earlier or is the duration of the sleep time also been shortened? Uh, so the duration of the sleep time is shortened and that has to do with the fact that they are quite disrupted as well. And so they, they tend to sleep shorter bursts and also more fragmented across the day. So when you add that all together, yes, they have less sleep time. It's not because they need less sleep time, but for whatever reason, those consolidated bouts that were responding to the clock are no longer responding in the way that they yeah. would have. And of course, again, part of this is to do with light exposure. So typically people who are old, especially in care homes, the levels of light exposure tend to be quite low. And therefore the strength of the clock as a result is also reduced. So one study has shown that simply by, in, by, by scheduling bright light exposure of elderly patients, so taking them outside or increasing the levels of lighting within the nursing home are enough to strengthen circadian rhythms and all the downstream outputs such as uh, regulation of sleep. So light's a very large component of that. Fantastic. I mean, it's both uh, the genetics, but also very important, like the environments, right? The shapes, those, those phenomena. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the genetics is one part of it, but the environment is, is a huge part of it as well. Yeah. Fascinating. Yep. So um, folks, you're very welcome to meet yourself and, and, and ask Dr. Yaganath more questions if you would like. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry if I've chased through all of the biology over there really quickly but yeah both it's of these things are i mean other the first bit on sick is not published but the i mean the second bit on the sick story that i showed you is not published but the first is and our other paper was recently published as well so please do go out and read both and it was in nature communications you mentioned no that's right yeah yeah I'll ask you another question. In the meantime, I, I suppose I take the right of the of the convener. So, what are what are some of the uh, current research approaches that you're developing that you haven't talked about today, in relation? Uh, to yeah, I mean, in the interest of time, I decided to stick with these two. But part of what mm -hmm. we're doing that I'm really excited about, where especially I think I I, I was quite excited to learn about your hub, um, is where we're working on uh, the clock's effect on chromatin organization and genome stability, where we know that sleep disruption has a big impact on restructuring chromosomes and enabling DNA repair. So sleep and circadian and this disruption is having a big impact over there. And what we're finding out now is the sorts of uh, consequences that happen downstream of that. So we use techniques such as attack seek um, in combination with other genome profiling uh, methods. And what we're finding is that um, restructuring of the genome tends to happen a lot when you're asleep and we think one of the reasons this is happening is to be able to enable repair especially in those sorts of cells that need to last your entire life such as neurons mm -hmm. um, and while this is still a hypothesis it's still a theory it may be that one of the reasons we do need to sleep is that we need to be able to maintain this sort of DNA repair that happens at the time. So we're profile, we're, we're doing some research into this, and I think there could be a lot of interesting overlap with your network over there. Uh, so that would be great to chat about at some point. Absolutely, I'm sure that not only myself, but also a lot of folks from all different divisions of Oxford mm. will be very keen to, to explore this a bit deeper. Yeah. No, that would be great. Yeah. So that, that's an area that we're working on that we're quite excited at the moment. We're also working on other members of the sick kinase family and trying to understand how this whole system uh, knits together. Fantastic. I think there's a question. Oh, there. We, actually, we actually do have a question from uh, Jacques Dia. So Jacques, if you're able to do so, please unmute yourself. And yeah, there you go. Hi there. Yeah, thank you. It was a really fascinating talk. Um, just with regard to the comment you had about um, in care homes with regard to sleep, uh, the, the, the rhythms and light. With that study that, you, that was conducted there, was it specific um, uh, light fluxes that they were looking at? Was there one type of light that they managed to identify or were they just looking at if it's um, actual, the, the light that was used actually worked as a comparison to daylight? No, that's a really good question. So no, they were not comparing with daylight then. They were just looking at overall exposure and they, and by brightening, 
the lights within the care home. So just brightening the artificial lights were in itself was having an effect. I think it, this wasn't fine-tuned to the level of looking at whether it was a certain lux or a certain wavelength. But uh, I mean, of course, the thinking is that blue is very important. And that is because one of the main circadian photoreceptors, which is melanopsin, is blue light sensitive. So it, 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 intuitively, it feels right. But uh, in this particular study, no, they hadn't actually broken down which kind of light. Um, but I think any kind of light, as long as it's bright enough and is able to hit and activate these photoreceptors is great. Of course, indoor lighting can never match outdoor lighting. So outdoor lighting can reach up to 10,000 lux even in the shade, whereas indoors we're dealing with about 1,000 say max. Excellent, Thank excellent you. question and, and really interesting answer. Thank you so much for that, Shax. There's still time for perhaps one more question, if anybody would like to ask. I do have perhaps one more question to ask you. Shall I? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so so I think that obviously uh, as a pre-pandemic -pre era, your research is highly um, highly pertinent, I feel, to the entire research community where we're all traveling around the globe to go to conferences. That's been taken away for obvious reasons in the last year plus. Uh, but hopefully as things open up, we will continue to, to travel around. And you as a scholar yourself, I'm sure that you, 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 you take a page of your own book. So if I may ask you something a bit more personal, what advice do you take to yourself and what advice <laughs> will you give to us when we go travel around the globe? <laughs> And, and enjoy the jet lag. What, what are the to-do things that you recommend? Oh, uh, well, if you are traveling east, I would say seek morning light. If you're traveling west, look for evening light. Uh, so light is the single most powerful thing to take out there. Alongside from this work on adenosine, what we also know is if you take caffeine at the right time, that will help. So caffeine in the evening, again, if you're traveling west, or mm -hmm. caffeine early in the morning. If you're traveling east, these will help. And of course, in the evenings, if you're going to a conference, just lots of beer. <laughs> but I mean, it, but considering, I mean, you mentioned the pandemic, what we've also done um, is so shift workers happen to be far more sensitive to uh, the effects of COVID. And so the risk of being hospitalized among shift workers is much higher. And what yep. we've tried to do is try and understand whether there's anything that can explain that. And it's really interesting because if you look at the transcriptomes in the lung of sleep deprived animals, which is what we've been doing, a whole lot of components that could explain higher infectivity levels as well as a more heightened immune response tend to all show up in sleep dep uh, deprived animals in circadian disruption as well. So um, it's pertinent, not just to us travelers, but then to, to, a, lot, to a lot of different sections of society. I see. So it's a bit more complicated the picture than I, I thought it would be. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Harty. It's it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to 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 hear a bit more from your research. Um, if if you don't mind, Harty, I'll ask you to share your screen so that I can share mine as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for that. So I would like to conclude with um, two short take on messages. Well, it's a message and and, and a reminder. And there is the take home messages that really as, as highlighted throughout the series of online seminar series that we've been hosting in the last year, it really takes different disciplines to come together to figure out how to live longer better. And some of the research that RT has been showcasing today really hits the nail on the head, as they say in English, in terms of how important understanding both the genetics, but also the environment and what pertains to, to uh, a longer and prosperous life. So on that note, Artie, pleasure to, to have hosted you. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank obviously you for the, the opportunity again. My pleasure. And, and obviously in the normal world, I'll be taking you out for beers and, and a nice meal. So that's still on the table. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll repay that whenever we can um, yeah, no, join together. Absolutely. Yeah, and we also have got some, some pending topics for <laughs> grant proposals to discuss with, together with Lynn Cox. <laughs> Fantastic. And on that note, I would like to conclude today's seminar by reminding you that we will be taking a August summer break and our next speaker will be Dr. Jeff Lemaitre from the CRNS in France. He is a biodemographer and he will be talking to us about his research.
on the eco-evolutionary roots of sex, sex differences in aging. So I hope to see you all then. And Arti, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate Thanks it. Again.